today's session, we're going to have a look at hydrotherapy, run through a few things, just a bit of an overview really of, of what we do and kind of what to expect as well if you're wanting to jump in the pool at any stage. Um, Where is the pool? Do you have the pool on the premises? We Down at Charlie Gardeners, we use their pool in the physio department. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, one of the downsides to where we are is we don't have a pool on premises, but we do have, we use the one at, at Charlie's, which is actually a really nice one, which is the photo that you can see at the moment. Um, it's a good, really good size um, for anyone who was at our old place back at Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, it's bigger than the pool there and it's a little bit nicer than that pool as well. So, um, and there's, there's change rooms and showers and everything on site. Uh, as well. So what we will have a look at, essentially we'll run through what is hydrotherapy, um, the principles of hydrotherapy. We won't go into like too much detail, more just in the context of what we do uh, for the most part. Um, benefits and then having a look at a few of the common conditions that we manage. So to start off with, what is hydrotherapy? Um, comes under a few different names, aquatic therapy, water therapy, um, aqua therapy. So depending on who you ask and where you are, you might get a different kind of name. Um, and then w under each of those, there's a few kind of different, different um, types of hydrotherapy, I guess, as well. So cold water versus warm water, um, non-immersion versus jumping in the water. But in the context of what uh, we'll be chatting about, um, we will be looking at, well, hydrotherapy is essentially any activity or exercise performed in the water, uh, which assists in the process of rehabilitation or recovery of, for a specific condition. Um, and we'll be talking about warm water hydrotherapy, which is what we, we do. So, um, three main principles that we'll look at. It's starting with buoyancy, hydrostatic pressure, heat transfer. So, um, obviously, I'm not an expert in fluid dynamics or mechanics or things like that. So, if there's anyone out there that <coughs> is, feel free to correct me as I go along. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there's there's a whole lot more involved, and there's a lot of uh, sort of physiological aspects to it as well, but um, again, we won't need to cover any of that. But if you do have any questions about that, I'm happy happy to to run through um, run through a few things, and we can have a chat afterwards, and I can send through some some information as we go as well. So, starting with buoyancy, essentially, um, what causes you to float in water? What causes an object to float in water? So, the upward thrust of a fluid. Um, which opposes the weight of the object that's in the water. The way it works is essentially when you're in a pool, the water at the bottom is, uh, or in, in any kind of container with water in it, the water at the bottom has higher pressure than the water at the top. And as you put something in, the, the weight of that object will displace um, a certain amount of water. Uh, and then there'll be some, the, the higher pressure at the bottom will work against gravity, essentially. So to push back up against, to try and um, force that object out of the water. So this is kind of the main principle that we, uh, we work on when you're in the pool, because um, I'll run through it a bit later as well, but most of the people that we see, obviously arthritis based or post-surgery or pre-surgery where they're kind of limited weight bearing or weight bearing on land can be quite painful. So being able to get into the pool um, and that buoyancy providing a, a sense of sort of almost weightlessness, but it's a supporting part of your weight um, does help quite a bit. So moving on to the sort of clinical aspects of it. Uh, again, that buoyancy partially supporting an individual's weight, uh, which then in turn takes a bit of load off affected joints and muscles and things like that. Um, it allows for greater freedom of movement. So you can get around a little bit more easily. Um, you're not having to support that, uh, support the same amount of weight that you, you would be on land. 
um, and it's really nice as well. So for for people who post surgery aren't able to fully wait there. Um, so for example, like some some uh, joint replacements or um, reconstructions where you can't put all of your weight through a limb, you're actually able to, to walk or get in the water and, and kind of just walk around normally because that water is supporting part of your weight. So a bit of a, bit of a diagram there on the right hand side it gives you an idea of what kind of uh, percentage your, your body weight is supported as you get deeper into the water. So waist depth um, is about 50% of body weight. So for example, someone who's um, had a, uh, like a hip preservation type surgery where they've, uh, their bone's been cut, they're only allowed to partially weight there for the first couple of weeks, uh, usually up to about 50%. So they'll be on crutches and they won't be able to put all of their weight through one limb or the other. Whereas in the water, they'll be able to walk around at waist depth without any trouble at all, um, without risk of damaging that, um, that procedure or um, any of the work that they've had done. They don't need to use their crutches um, and they can just get around a little bit more comfortably. Um, all right, so yeah, so again, buoyancy is kind of our, the main one that we work off and, and people find that the most beneficial uh, for what they come in for. So hydrostatic pressure, which is essentially just the, the, the pressure that the water applies to you when you're in, when you're in the water. Um, so uh, explained really well by Pascal's law, essentially when an object or body part in this case is immersed in a fluid that's at rest, so water that's not moving uh, like in a pool, uh, that fluid will exert equal pressure on all surface areas that are in that water. Um, and it's relative to the depth as well. So the deeper you go, the more pressure you will be under. So taking, for example, a, a scuba diver, um, as they go deeper and deeper, having to, to equalise, there's a bit more pressure um, <clears throat> placed on them. And the, the amount of pressure um, is is equal across all, all body parts, dependent on the depth that they're at. Um, so nice little diagram just at the bottom here explaining that. Um, at the top of that, that tube, there's less pressure because there's not as much, uh, not as much weight on top. Um, so the, that spout of water is not sort of as strong as the one right down at the bottom where the, the pressure is, is the greatest because um, you've got the weight of the water on top plus gravity pulling it down as well. Um, and this, uh, the, the pressure aspect we'll have a bit of a chat about. I think we'll cover it in here a little bit. Yep. So, um, again, looking at it from a clinical perspective, um, the pressure of the water essentially acts the same way as a compression garment. Um, and again, equal pressure all around a body part. So if you're, for example, just standing straight up in water, um, at about sort of chest depth, as is like the example that's given on the bottom here, the amount of pressure being applied to your ankles will be greater than the amount of pressure that's being applied uh, around your chest, just because, again, the weight of that water at the bottom um, and the, the force of gravity pulling it down is going to be greater. A um, couple of things this is, this is really helpful for. So as you can imagine, having a bit of compression is going to help um, help swelling. Uh, so the same way someone with lymphedema or, or, or edema may wear a compression stocking or for example like flying in a plane which we haven't done for a little bit but if you're sitting um, sitting in a plane for long periods the ankles get all swollen and all puffy because uh, your body's just not able to, to circulate and pump that fluid as efficiently as it would be if you were lying down for example, or walking or doing a little bit of exercise. So the compression of that water or the, the pressure that that water applies on your, on your body helps to increase or promote a bit more circulation. Um, and it essentially 
as, as, we, as it says here, increases your, your venous return and lymphatic drainage, uh, especially in your extremities. So the way it works, it increases that amount, of, increases the flow from the periphery, which is your ankles and, and wrists and sort of the parts that are further away from your heart and pushes it up towards, um, up towards your abdomen, up towards your heart. Essentially, that. does it only work while you're in the water? So once you get out, yeah, your edema comes back again, just the same as it would have been. Yeah, yeah. So um, again, same same as with a with a stocking, it's kind of a short term effect. Um, it's yeah, it works while you're in the water, the same as while you're wearing a stocking, it, it works well. But once you once you come out, obviously there's a bit of a residual effect. It'll it'll hang around for a while, mm -hmm. like it won't return immediately. Um, but it's beneficial for healing for the, for the yeah blood. yeah yeah definitely so it can it can just kind of help get that process started as well um, so if you if you're struggling or if you, your body's struggling to just get the fluid moving initially um, is, is a really nice way just to help get things started mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, yeah just help help the process along a little bit um, yeah, and then decreased blood pooling in the extremities. So decreased pooling of, of fluid and, and blood and lymph, lymphatic fluid and things like that as well. Um, so it used it's used quite a bit in people who have lymphedema um, and, and do sort of struggle with that, um, I guess, transport of fluid away from, from the extremities in your feet and ankles particularly and lower limbs. Um, and again, just having a look at quick look at this diagram, um, that this image on the left, just demonstrating that uh, there's an equal amount of pressure being applied to a particular body part at a certain depth. Um, and then that one on the left, just demonstrating again, as you go deeper, the more pressure is applied. Uh, all right. So again, as I said, my my knowledge of Fluid dynamics and mechanics is pretty limited, so feel free to correct me later on. Um, all right, so heat. Heat is the other one that is, I guess, relevant to relevant to us because we work in a warmer pool. Our pool usually sits between 33 to 35 degrees, uh, depending on the day and depending on the amount of water in the pool. So Water is a really nice heat conductor. It, um, it absorbs heat really well. It hangs on to that heat really well and it transfers it really efficiently between itself and other objects. So um, water has a, a, a specific heat, which is four times uh, the equivalent mass of air. <clears throat> so essentially the amount of energy that it takes to heat say one liter of water is four times the amount of energy that it would take to, to heat that same amount of air. And then it also holds on to that heat a lot, a lot better as well. So it doesn't dissipate quite as, as quickly um, as air. Uh, so transfer of heat between water and our bodies in this case is done or we achieve that mostly by conduction, which is just the direct contact between water and our body. Um, and then uh, convection is the other way. So as you move through the water, the flow of water, like flow of water over your skin also um, helps to, to transfer that heat. So actually we'll go on to the next one. I'll chat about it there. All right, so because our pool kind of sits just below body temperature or core body temperature. Um, it'll feel really warm when you first jump in, just like a, like a bath, essentially, like a warm bath. But as you spend time in there, it'll, it'll equalize, it won't feel, obviously won't feel as warm as when you jumped in. Uh, because your, your, uh, uh, the pool will initially transfer its heat to, to you or to your, to your skin um, and to the, the couple of layers just below your skin. Um, but when that, that heat kind of equalizes a little bit 
And as you go along and as you start doing a few exercises, your body temperature actually increases a little bit. So that will then dissipate back out into the water, which is why when people swimming, either like the Rottnest Channel Swim or the Channel Swim in, in the UK, um, the risk of hyp hypothermia is quite high uh, because even though you're, you're exercising your body generating heat, that heat is being transferred out of your body really quickly into the water. Um, and because the water is colder than your core body temperature, that transfer is, is, is really quite rapid um, and it's just non-stop. Um, and the only way you would kind of, that wouldn't happen is if you're in water that is uh, warmer than your body temperature, for example. So looking at how it affects us in this context, um, it really only kind of, the, the heat really only gets down to sort of that two centimetre mark below the skin, so that subcutaneous tissue. Uh, which is still enough to have an effect because we have a lot of um, a lot of blood capillaries and blood vessels and, and arteries and things like that, even just below the layer of our skin. So its primary effect really is just uh, an increase in blood flow. So that heat promotes the vasodilation or the, the increase in size of your blood of your arteries, um, which then increases the amount of just blood flow um, to muscles and other areas of your body increases. So um, as we run through here, yeah, increases your muscle elasticity, again, because you're getting more, more blood flow, which then increases your range of movement. Um, it has an analgesic effect as well. So I'm sure everyone's had a go at putting a heat pack on a sore back or a sore neck or a shoulder or something like that, which is really helpful most of the time. So that help that, that bit of heat, even, even though it is just superficial, does actually help to, to settle things down a little bit. It helps to sort of calm the nervous system a little bit and, um, and help uh, just relieve a bit of pain. And, then the other thing it does, I kind of touched on briefly, was the transfer of heat away from your body as you're exercising. So again, as you exercise, a byproduct of muscle contraction and energy production in your body is heat. Um, so I'm sure as you sort of you increase your rate of exercise, your body heats up, you start sweating. In the pool, that rather than you sweating, um, that heat's kind of just transferred into the water, essentially, which uh, helps in recovery because uh, you're not your body's not having to fight against those byproducts, uh, not having to then kind of put it back into the system and recirculate it and and, and get rid of it that way. Um, so yeah, the, another another way that's sort of really nice. Um, nice effect of, of heat jumping in the pool. But again, because our pool is, sits below kind of uh, below body temperature, um, it doesn't, it may not have the same sort of physiological effects as if you're, say, going and having, doing hot water hydrotherapy, which is a, a again, just jumping in water or having water applied to a certain body part. Um, usually it's sort of between 40 and 50 degrees Celsius. Um, how long are you normally in the water? So if you're doing an exercise, yeah. how, long, how long would you be in the pool for? Um, well, our, our sessions run for about an hour. So just sort of the same same time as a kind of your normal exercise session. But I mean, any, any time from, from half an hour to an hour, really, up, um, depending on... on whether you want to do, do the full hour or not. Um, so yeah, not, not a huge amount of time. Um, obviously, if, you, if the water was colder, you probably wouldn't spend as long in there because you, you would cool down quite a bit and get yeah. cold and uncomfortable. Same as if you like swimming in the ocean, unless you've got a wetsuit on. Uh, mm. All right. This one, no, that was it. So 
we've kind of run through the benefits under each section as well. Uh, but I just wanted to sort of summarise a little bit uh, the things that we, we ran through. So, again, starting at the top, the main thing that we, we look at, because most of, our, uh, most of our patients who come through are either pre-surgery, post-surgery, uh, for things like joint replacements and sporting injuries, that, um, that buoyancy effect and that sort of weight supporting effect is our kind of our, our primary mechanism for, for doing things. Um, it just allows you to do a little bit more weight bearing exercise. Um, it helps to facilitate um, sort of in, and, and initiate a bit of resistance exercise. Um, even without any kind of equipment. So you can just work against the resistance of the water as you do your exercises. All right, go back one. There you go. Um, yeah, so that buoyancy, kind of number one, uh, the, the pressure of the water, again, is quite important. So post-surgery, say, for example, knee surgery, where you might have a bit of peripheral swelling, a bit of peripheral um, edema and um, fluid, build up that pressure just helps to, to get things going um, help I guess prevent an increase as well in, in any more um, any more swelling peripherally so like a wave like around your ankles and, and feet and things like that um, but as, as Margaret pointed out it's uh, it's a temporary kind of effect so it's working while you're in the water but once you jump out, that effect kind of dissipates pretty pretty quickly. Um, but what again, what it does allow you to do, it kind of just kickstarts the process and allows you to to then work on it while you're not in the pool as well. Um, and then on the whole, all of those things together, we end up with decreased pain, improved function, um, allowing you just to do a little bit more than you might do otherwise. Um, a little bit more than you might be able to do sort of in the gym or, or at home or things like that, where you're limited in, especially again, those weight bearing activities. Um, or if you're finding just particular movements quite painful, um, the heat and the pressure of the water can just help to settle down that, that pain response and settle down your nervous system a little bit to allow you to then just move a little bit more freely. Um, now, in terms of times we wouldn't let anybody into the pool, there are a few. Um, I've not the only instance where usually it's a problem for us is open wounds or infections. So, for those of you who have had surgery and have had a go at, at hydrotherapy, um, you'll know that you're not allowed in the pool until your wound is nicely healed. Um, and there's no sort of there's no open bits and there's no indication of infections or anything like that. Um, the other th the other kind of major ones are uncontrolled cardiovascular and respiratory conditions. Um, the reason being because one when you get in the water, the change in pressure and temperature um, increases your cardiac output and increases the amount of work that your heart and your lungs have to do. Um, to work against, firstly, the pressure of the water um, and the, the, the increased heat as well. <clears throat> so if you have, yeah, if, if you have uh, either cardiovascular or respiratory conditions that are uncontrolled, um, so they're not, out, not able to, um, I guess, or automatically respond to those changes in, in environments, um, then we would probably suggest you you don't jump in the water, um, or at least nothing kind of above waist depth. Um, and then the other ones, things infections that are spread through water, so things like UTIs, warts, <clears throat> antinia, any kind of like fungal conditions. Um, people are usually pretty good, and we'll make sure that. Um, if there's anything and if there's anything that they're not sure about, we always get it checked uh, beforehand. But feel free if like if you're, say for example, um, 
booked a session for the pool, you come down and you've got a wound or something that you're not quite sure about, we're more, more, we're more than happy to, to have a look and sort of give you the, the yes or no as to whether you should be jumping into the pool um, or not. So I wanted to finish off quickly with just, a, um, I guess, a comparison between hydrotherapy and land-based exercise. Um, there's, unfortunately, even though hydrotherapy, water therapy, aquatic therapy has been around for a long time, there's not a whole lot of research. Um, there's not a lot of research around to kind of um, support the benefits of it for things like rehabilitation, um, management of lymphedema, cardiac conditions, things like that. Um, the, the studies that have been done are fairly small in numbers, so the, the power and this, this kind of significance is pretty, pretty limited. Um, but on the whole, when you're comparing hydrotherapy to, say, someone who's not doing anything at all, obviously there's, there, there is a benefit. Um, but then when we look at it compared to, say, for example, exercise in the gym, um, outcomes are fairly similar. So for example, someone with knee osteoarthritis um, who has either, uh, does either hydrotherapy or uh, resistance-based exercise in the gym, um, their, their outcomes are, are pretty similar in terms of pain and strength gains and mobility and, and things like that. Um, the reason being uh, kind of, the, the physiological responses that you get from being in the water are very similar to the responses you get from just doing exercise in general. Uh, exercise in general. So, like I mentioned, with uh, with the cardiovascular uh, conditions, getting in the water, you have the, the pressure of the water results in an increase in cardiac output. So your your heart has to work a bit harder to pump the blood around your body, but you also get an increase in blood flow um, to extremities, increase in body temperature, things like that. Um, you have to breathe a little bit harder, so your lungs have to work a bit harder to, to work against the pressure of the water. So if you're in water in a pool, um, sort of at chest depth, you're having to work against the weight of that water to essentially breathe the same amount. So even just being in water, even just being submerged in water um, can have a, a beneficial effect essentially. Um, so if, you, if you, you are really limited in what else you can do, um, it's, just a, it's just a nice option, I think, to, to get things going. And that's essentially how we use it as well. So we use it quite early post-surgery. Um, as soon as people can jump in the water, um, we'll get them in just to get the ball rolling and we'll use it in conjunction with the work that you do at the gym. So very rarely we, we would use hydrotherapy on its own. Um, we we'll use it as a bit of a, um, a segue into doing a little bit more in the gym just to help manage pain a little bit, um, increase mobility and in joints, um, especially for knees and hips, uh, things like that. You don't literally mean jump in the pool. You mean ease yourself into the pool. Ease yourself into the pool. Yeah, yeah. Step down the very shallow steps. Um, all right. So just a, a quick overview of the main things that we, we see at the pool. Um, I, I have mentioned them a few times. So arthritis is the main one, either osteoarthritis or, or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, pre and post surgery. So joint replacements, obviously reconstructions, uh, joint resurfacing, which again is one of those, also joint resurfacing and hip preservation surgeries. They're really, they're kind of examples of, of surgeries where you can't fully weight bear post-surgery. So jumping in the pool to allow you just to, to get back to kind of walking normally without putting the, the same amount of weight through, through those joints is um, a really nice option. Sports injuries, chronic pain, as well, because like I said, the, the heat and that kind of tactile response from the water helps to settle down that central nerve or helps just settle down that, that pain response that you get. 
um, and then lymphedema as well. So these are kind of our main, uh, the, the main conditions that we see. We don't see a lot of, or, or any really cardiac um, specific conditions or respiratory specific conditions. Um, maybe the occasional uh, neuro condition like MS or someone post stroke. Um, but again, we don't, we don't, not a whole lot of those because there are specialized centers that do that as well. 